Go to the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 9. <laughs> you got that, didn't you? I don't have to explain that later to you or nothing. All right, good. Amen, amen. Now you'll be claiming that's original. And then we'll both be lying. <laughs> amen. I don't know where it came from, but I, I like it. Ezra chapter 9 tonight. And let's begin reading in verse number 5. Ezra. Chapter 9, it says at verse 5, it says, And at the evening sacrifice I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment, my mantle, I fell upon my knees, and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, and said, O my God, I am ashamed and blushed to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up uh, under the heavens. Uh, since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the land, to the sword, to the captivity, and to a spoil, and to confusion of face, as it is this day. It's starting to sound like the State of the Union. Amen. Verse number 8 says this, And now, for a little space, grace hath been showed uh, from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. That is our desire tonight, that God would give us a little reviving. Uh, Paul wrote to Timothy in, uh, in uh, Second Epistle, chapter 3, This know also on the last days, perilous Time shall come. So, you know, whatever's going on shouldn't come as any surprise to anybody. But I'm here happy to announce tonight that God is still uh, not only able but willing to give us a little reviving. And that's what we gather here uh, for tonight. Amen. And so that's our prayer and uh, that's our desire. That's the name of the message. And let's pray and go on with it. And I'd like my friend uh, Pastor Parks to pray for the message tonight, if you would, preacher. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Thank you, preacher. Now, the verse is, uh, I used this verse in another message one time, a revival message. And uh, for that phraseology there, I guess you call it a little reviving. But boy, the more I got looking at the verse, there's a boatload right there. And we're going to stay right in the verse pretty much right now tonight. It says a lot. He says, uh, and now for a little space. And now for a little space. Now that's an interesting thing. Now I don't know what comes to mind uh, when you think of a little space. I don't know if it's NASA. I don't know if it's uh, uh, something to do. God's got a space program. And I'm going to show it to you tonight. And uh, tell you, let's take our Bible. Let's get a Bible definition of space. I mean, you can Google it, but not tonight, please, while you're in church. You can go home and look it up in your 1828 if you want. But, you know, there's a, and that's all fine. There's a tried and true method that still works. And it's called, get ready, don't ask me where I learned this. Okay, you can. It's called comparing Scripture with Scripture. He says, and now for a little space. So let's get, a, let's get an idea of what he's talking about. Take your Bible, go to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. And uh, verse number 1. And the writer writes this, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. You see that? About the space of half an hour. Now there have been some, some of our colleagues, some of our brethren, uh, that have attempted to use that very verse right there to uh, bring in a doctrine about there being no women in heaven because... There's silence for half an hour. Now, I'm not saying I subscribe to that. I'm just saying that I've heard that said. But my experience traveling around the country, if that's the case, there won't be any men there either. <laughs> Amen. But I'll tell you what you do get out of that verse right there. You get a definition for what space means because the verse shows us that it's a, an interval of time. 
And in this case, it's a space of half an hour. And, and, and Ezra recorded now for a little space. So we're talking about an interval of, of time. Take your Bible, go back to Revelation chapter 2. <coughs> Revelation chapter 2, and I'm going to show you why that's important. And it manifests the mercy of God at the same time. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, and uh, let's begin at verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest uh, that woman Jezebel, uh, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, uh, to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed on idols. Now, uh, without question, and definitely in my mind, uh, Jezebel is absolutely the most wicked female in the Bible. I mean, she's in competition for one of the worst people in the entire Bible. And with that being said, uh, look what it says in verse 21. And I gave her space yeah. to repent Amen. of her fornication. And she repented not. I guarantee you right now where she's at, she wishes she would have. She's right with God now. She's a Bible believer tonight, yeah. just like everybody else that's lifting up their eyes in hell. But I say that to say this, the wickedest woman, the one that slaughtered prophets, amen, and blasphemed God, and God was even willing to give her a chance. Now, she didn't take it, and she should have. But I'm here to tell you tonight that he gives you and I a space to repent as well. And I'm not asking if you're saved, but I'm telling you there's times when we're not as right with God, we're not walking with God uh, like we ought to, and I'll tell you, God gives us a chance to do something about it, and God gives us a chance to repent, and I'm here to tell you tonight that if you don't take it, well, there'll be no revival for you. That's our subject tonight, a little reviving. Uh, this isn't a salvation message, but if you're not saved, you need to be. You should be. I'll sure enough tell you before this thing's over how you can be. But I'm talking to uh, believers tonight, and God is so merciful that he's given us a, a space to repent. And boy, take him up on it. This isn't just another gathering, amen. This is the real thing. This is the realest thing I've ever run into on this planet. If the Spirit of God deals with your heart about anything during the course of the pre uh, preaching, make your way to wherever you got to to get alone with God. Now, personally, I'm still a fan of the old-fashioned altar. Amen. Uh, it works for me. Some of the sweetest times I've ever spent with my Lord have been right there uh, next to the pulpit over at the old building or the second old building. I don't know how many old buildings we had, but I mean, I responded to a message and gone up and just talked to God and let God talk to me. And I still think, and I know you don't have to do it that way. We've got to offer so many disclaimers, and, but I tell you what, I'm just saying, you better do something somewhere. I mean, if you want a shot of revival. I mean, if there's something that needs your penitent, I mean, if you come in here with ought in your heart in some area that God has been specific about and you're just bound and determined that you're not going to fix that up, but you'll see what you can get anyway. I'm going to tell you why you're wasting your time. And don't waste your time. And don't waste God's time. Let's be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Let's try to get God in on this thing. Like I said, we're two or three to gather together and in my name, he said, there am I in the midst. And he's, he's in this. He's here. Amen. Amen. Don't miss it. Amen. Don't miss it. Amen. It says, and now for a little space. And then, oh yeah, I like this next part too. It says, now for a little space. Now that's an interval of time. And then he says this, grace has been shown. You know, you might like getting grace from your credit card company, but this thing says, uh, grace has been shown from the Lord our God. Now that's where you want to get it from. Not a lot of definitions, I guess, but uh, one of them I read, I liked it. Free, unmerited love and favor. Now, you might think you're something, but I get in the mirror and I know it's unmerited. Yeah. Amen. And, uh, and let me get it to you like this. Now, over there in Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Uh, first time I read that, the Bible says there, it says, More of the law entered 
that the offense might abound. Now, I, I don't know what you think of when you read that. Maybe you knew that he's talking about the law of Moses and uh, where the law entered, blah, blah, blah. But I'll tell you what I thought about. I thought about that morning over in uh, uh, North Dayton when ATF took the front door of my house down uh, with a warrant, and they came in with the FBI and the DEA and the Kane Task Force and woke me up after being high for four days, and they tore my plates apart. And, buddy, before they left, after towing off Corvettes and motorcycles and everything, I own, amen, the offense abounded. Said more of the law entered, uh, uh, more over, yeah, more of the law entered, uh, really, I'm having a mental block on a verse I use all the time. <laughs> uh, more of the law entered, but, uh, okay, all right, go to Romans 5, it's okay. God does that to keep us humble, and I appreciate it when he does, I'm just going to be honest with you, Amen. Romans chapter 5, we're going to be uh, faithful to the scripture. Verse number 20. I always get it before I get it, before I get to it. Uh, more of the law entered that the offense might abound. Yeah. Lord, you know I knew that. Okay, okay. It said, but then, look what it says after that. Yeah. Where sin abounded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody resemble that remark? Yeah. <laughs> Where sin abounded, grace! Did much more about I had a guy in jail. I had a guy in jail. I had a Vietnam vet in Missouri. I've had people say, I've done too much. God cannot forgive me. I said, I don't know how to break the news to you, pal. That's just your stinking pride. He went, what? I said, God's got more grace than everybody in the whole world's got ability to sin. Amen. You're no match for his grace. Thank God. It says in our little space, a grace a hath been showed from the Lord our God. Here's one of my favorites. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Come on now. Grace that is greater than all my sin, all our sin. All together, boy, thank God for grace. Amen. A friend of mine, Ron Hoy, is doing a video, a Christian video called Grace Did This. So we stuck that up there last night and sent him a, a picture. That's what that's about. But I'll tell you what, man, how can that not be uh, uh, appropriate? Thank God for grace. The Bible says this, and we all know the verse. Do we all know the verse? Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, the preacher, Brother Gresham, came into county jail and said, we're going to see, we're going to see what the Bible says about you men. And I thought to myself, this cat does not know nothing about me. We were light years apart in every way. He's got this big old Bible and he's going to, and he opened right to Romans chapter 3 and he read, all is sin and come short of the glory of God. I thought, that's interesting. That didn't take very long to find me. I knew I was a sinner. Amen. That's why they like preaching in jail. They know they're sinners. You can just move right on to the Savior. If you're in here tonight, I'm telling you, if you're not saved, you're a sinner. Therefore, you need to be saved. If that came as a surprise to you. Don't worry. We'll take all the time we need to show you from that book that you're not going to get into heaven by your own merit. That's okay because God's got a remedy for that. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes. Amen. Yes. David Spurgeon did not turn over a new leaf. I liked the old leaf. I was good. I was having a good time. That 30-year in prison thing was not going to be fun, but I got more friends behind bars than some of you got out here anyway. Yes. But I tell you what, that hell thing, uh uh no, I thought I was a tough guy, and I ran with some tough guys, but I knew early on I wasn't tough enough for that weeping, wailing, gnashing. I've seen all that, and I didn't want no part of it. Amen. And I got it on, let me think, what, oh, grace. Amen. Amen. That next verse in verse 24, we all know verse 23, but verse 24 says, being justified freely, yes, sir, by his grace Amen. through the redemption that is in uh, Christ Jesus. It's that novel little space, grace hath been shown. Boy, I'll tell you what, two of the most precious verses in the entire Bible, over there in Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. I mean, if you don't take it at face value, he adds this, and that not of yourselves. And then if you don't take that at face value, then he adds, it is the gift of God. And boy, if you don't get that, he's going to clear it up and say, not of works. Lest any man should boast. Say, what is he trying to say? Well, hello, duh. He's saying, for by grace are you saved through faith. I'm glad I got in on it. 
Amen. Let me tell you how this goes. It has never been easier in the history of humankind. It has never been easier to be saved than it is right now in this dispensation of grace. It's never been this easy before, and it ain't never going to be this easy again. Buddy, that trumpet blows and millions disappear like Doc wrote. Amen. I'm going to tell you what, that grace is over. Amen. Things are going to change. You better get it now. You don't get it now. You probably ain't going to get it then. I get it while you can. Amen. It, we're talking about grace. He said, and now for a little space, grace has been showed for the Lord our God. That's a good place for an amen. I like to hear one. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And then uh, the verse goes on. Now, uh, Ezra chapter 9. The verse goes on. It says this. It says, uh, to leave us a remnant to escape. To leave us a remnant to escape. Over there in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, the Bible says this. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every, imagi every imagination of the thoughts of his heart <laughs> was only evil continually. That is quite a verse right there. That's about as definite as you can get. There's not any gray area in that thing whatsoever. Now that is the time just prior uh, to Noah's flood. Amen. To Noah beginning the ark. And then, you know, after that a while, uh, then the flood came. And the Lord spoke of those times. And when it was, uh, the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And he spoke of them and said it's going to be like that again. And he mentioned it over there in uh, the Gospels. And he said they did eat. They drank, they married wives, uh, they were given in marriage until the day Noah entered into the ark and the flood came, and watch what it says, and destroyed them all. Every human being on the face of the earth died in that flood. And you say, but wait, I thought, well... Genesis 6, 8 does say, uh, but uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, everybody on the earth was destroyed in a flood, but eight people weren't on the earth. Eight people entered into the ark. Eight people did what God said to do and were spared. There were a remnant. Amen. God, all through the Bible, God always had a faithful remnant Regardless of what day and age they, they lived in and how bad it got, how much bail worship prevailed, how far they got from the Lord, he always had a remnant, a faithful remnant, who refused to go with the flow. Amen. And this world is getting like the Lord said. This world is getting more like the days of Noah every day. And the Laodicean church is getting more apostate than ever. But beloved, I'm here to tell you, that doesn't mean you and I have to go along with that. I can read Revelation chapter 3 and the condition of the church just prior uh, to the Lord coming back, but I don't group myself. I, don't, I refuse to be part of that crowd that says they're rich and increased with goods and have need of none. The longer I'm saved, the more I realize how wicked I am. The more I realize how much I need the Lord. Amen. He always had a remnant, so we don't have to go along. How, how do you keep from uh, uh, getting caught up in all that? Do what he says. Like this song, uh, uh, sin kept me from it, not keeps me from sin. Psalm 119 verse 11 says this, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. So you got a sin problem, you back that thing up two verses, and do what it says, and let the word of God cleanse your heart, then get back in the book and stay in the book, and that'll take care of it. Do you really believe it's that easy? I'm just, I, yeah, that's what the book says. Amen. I know every time I failed, it's because I failed to stick with the book. Amen. And I failed, and I'm going to fail again. But I know where to go. The Bible said this, and now for a little space, grace has been shown uh, from the Lord our God. Amen. I have to leave us a remnant to escape. So I like that. That's why I don't get discouraged. That's why I don't spend all the time in front of the news that you guys do. I don't care. That stuff, okay, it's entertainment to me. Amen. Listen, if Hillary Clinton would have won the election, my orders weren't going to change. 
That thing didn't, I mean, I was just, I was prepared to vote for Donald Duck. I'm telling you the truth. Anybody. I didn't want to hear her voice. But uh, I'm going to tell you what, that, that's, that's like uh, Brother said the other day. There's, man, I remember a message you preached 25 years ago, uh, and you used a cross for an illustration down in Mount Airy, and that beam, on uh, that cross beam on the cross represented the temporal, uh, represented uh, the things of this earth, represented the horizontal, but that beam right there, and we get our whole stinking life wrapped around the temporal, and we need to look up. Yeah. And you look up, and the Lord's still smiling if you're doing right. Amen. All right, so the verse says, uh, a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place. Now, I've tried to figure out what that meant, and so I'm going to tell you what I figured out. And uh, maybe you've got something else, but I think you'll get a point here. It says, a nail in his holy place, and I think we use the verse, I use it a lot. Uh, second, uh, first, first Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, but as it is written... Now, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Right? And I like that. I like even just looking at the scripture and trying to picture what God got prepared, even though I know that the Bible says, pal, you ain't even going to scratch the surface. And uh, uh, conversely, the antithesis, is, antithesis of that is true as well. Uh, neither have entered into the heart of man how bad hell is. We try to preach it, but I mean, I've seen guys give illustrations of a furnace in New York City that's burning at 12 million degrees below, and I'm making it up because, uh, and I'm being honest about it, you can't illustrate how bad it would be. Amen. But we're talking about heaven uh, right now, and he's saying a nail in his, in his holy place. And, and not, I'm looking forward to it, but I got news for you. I got good news for you. Uh, you don't have to wait till you get to heaven to spend some time in his holy place. Yeah. David said in Psalm 122 and verse 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I thank God tonight for a haven of rest, refuge from the ungodliness of this world down here. I'm glad. I'm glad we can go to church. Amen. And we got churches that believe that we'll go to a clean place. Amen. Uh, where it's well lit, where it's clean, uh, where, no, where the devil's music isn't uh, uh, pounding through the walls. I pulled up to a light one time, and I mean, it bang, bang, bang. You know how that goes. And I thought, man, I, I'm deaf. I blew my ears out listening to the Beatles at 10 years old and machine guns and straight pipes and all that. And I know that when your mom says, you're going to ruin your hearing, Guess what? She was telling the truth. Amen. That's the first thing I thought of. Not how can that heathen be listening to that music? He's a lost guy. I understand lost people. I used to be one. Do you remember when you were one? Amen. I, I thought about his hearing. I said, man, that, that guy's going to kill us. And I looked in my mirror to see who it was and see what kind of, if his car was vibrating because mine was. <laughs> I look in the mirror and there's a Buick. A Buick with a sweet little old lady sitting there smiling. And she probably had a hearing loss too, because I don't think she heard it at all. And I thought, well, I knew it wasn't her. And I looked past her in my mirror, and there's old redneck in a pickup truck with a fishing pole in his rifle rack. Where I grew up, we had rifles in the rifle rack. Amen. Amen. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't him. <laughs> and it was, I'm talking about three cars back. This guy had this head banging stuff cranking so loud, I really felt sorry for him. Well, it is what it is. But we're not hearing it here tonight. Isn't it good there's a place you can go? Yeah. Amen. I can't think of a better thing but to call it a haven, a refuge, a place we can go to get away from the cares of this life for a little while. Amen. Isn't it good where nobody's going to be taking the Lord's name in vain in here tonight? I'm really confident of that. Nobody's going to hit on your wife or your daughter. And if they do, hit them back in yeah. Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> now, listen, I, here's what I, I want. Never underestimate the importance of church. This isn't just a club. Amen. That's a problem. Sometimes we've let this thing become more like a motorcycle club mentality uh, than the church of the living God. Well, if they're not wearing my colors, it doesn't matter if they're doing the same thing. don't matter if they look the same. don't matter if they want to do the same thing. They're not wearing my colors. They're inferior. That's the way we were in the gang days. Boy, one day, Lord showed me, it's not supposed to be that way here. Amen. It's not. I mean, I thank God for a church family. Amen. 
and uh, you ought to too. I don't see how people can sit home and watch TV while their church is meeting. They do. I appreciate you being here on Monday. I'm not trying to be ugly, but I'm telling you the truth. That thing he said to give us a nail in his holy place, and this is about as close as it's going to get. You're not going to hear this guy. You may go home somewhere and listen to what you think is Christian music, but it ain't going to be what... There's more doctrine in that hymnal than there is coming across the pulpit in most churches in America. I'm just saying. Amen. I love church. I really do. Amen. I'm an evangelist. I'm in church five, six, seven days a week. One time I linked three meetings together. We were in church 14 days in a row and drove about 1,000 miles during that. Amen. And I looked at my wife and kids after that, and I think, I think we're going to space this out a little bit. But we're in church a lot, at least three or four or five days a week, and driving around the country, flying to Alaska next week. I'm excited about it. Amen. But, uh, you know, somebody said to me one time, they said, you have to like church. You're an evangelist. And I thought, that's backwards. It's your job. You have to like. No, I like church so much that God let it be my job. Here's the difference. Some of you got to have to, and you need to get a hold of this get to. Because we get to do this. And there's brothers and sisters all over the world that wish they could, wish they could assemble like this with a nice building and, and, and a sign. And, and they're not, we didn't carry our Bibles in in a paper bag under our coat. We're not huddled in some basement somewhere uh, uh, sharing verses in a hushed tone. I could never be a evangelist in China. I'd be in jail the first night. What is that? Praise the Lord. Go get them. Amen. <coughs> a nail in his holy place. My dad's a carpenter. My dad, one of the neatest men I ever knew in my entire life. And I didn't appreciate him until after I got saved. I loved him. I'm... God, that honor your father and your mother thing, I know tonight that I lived through things that people around me didn't live through, and I thought I was tough, and I thought I was lucky, and I got saved, and I got in the Bible, and I found out that that honor thy father and thy mother, for this is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thy days be long on the earth. Uh, that had a lot to do with it. Now, I'm glad that even when I was breaking their heart with sinful behavior, and I was trying to keep it from them, uh, uh, I honored my parents best I could, and God honored that verse. How about that? Amen? My dad was a carpenter. My dad's a World War II combat vet. I preached his funeral, Brother Clifford, eight years ago. Stood over a flag-draped coffin with the 100% confidence that I was going to see him again. Amen. He's a saved man. My dad, after the war in Southern California, they're building houses up by Pasadena and Arcadia and Monrovia. And they're building houses, and he was on a decking crew. And he was the foreman. He was, uh, he was a great, uh, great carpenter. And uh, somebody invented the nailing machine, the na pneumatic nailer. And that was a threat to all the carpenters because, you know, everybody. This thing about people being afraid they're going to be replaced by machines ain't nothing new. And uh, so they, they showed up on the job site, and they're building 50, 100 homes at a time out there. And, uh, and somebody showed up, uh, and they're trying to promote this nailer, and they're running airlines up on the roof of the house. And uh, they're decking a the house, and they, want, they needed to get the best carpenter on the entire crew to race the nailer, race the nailing machine. And there's old Joe Spurgeon. I'm not just bragging, I am, but I've seen this on, what do they call it, 8 millimeter? You know, remember the slide for Joe? Okay, some of you don't. Some of you do. <laughs> Amen. I've seen this on an old grainy black and white uh, 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 movie on a screen. And uh, there's my dad. He's out there, and he's got his shirt off, and he's got big muscles. I never did mouth off to him. And, uh, and he's ready, set, go. He's got a nail apron. He's got a 28-ounce frame and a hammer because that guy could set a 16-penny nail and with one end, set it, and drive it with one end. And I seen him do it. And I watched him do it on this uh, video, this movie. And there they are. They're on the starting line. And my dad's got nails in his mouth. And my dad's got nails in his hand. And my dad's got nails in his nail apron. And it's a ready, set, go. And boy, they got an air compressor running. And here this guy pushing this thing. And he's hitting it. Punch! And then punch! And then he's driving these nails. And there's old Joe Spurgeon. He's taking off. Wham! Driving them nails. He's out in front. All the carpenters are cheering. And I'm a little kid. You know, I'm like six years old. I'm going, wow, this is really cool. And all of a sudden, my dad stopped. Looked like he was throwing the race. 
He just stopped, stood there, and the nail of machine went by, and he lost. I said, Dad, what happened? He said, I ran out of nails before the machine did. <laughs> Amen. My dad was a nailer. I'll tell you what, when my dad, this is before screw guns, do they still make hammers? They still make them because, I mean, you go by a job site now and all you hear is zit, 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 zit. I mean, you used to hear pounding, you know. And, uh, <laughs> all right, help me out, Lord. And when my dad put two pieces of lumber together with a nail, they were secure. That's how you held stuff together. My Bible says he's given us a nail in his holy place. And I'm here to tell you tonight, if you're saved... Your standing with God as a child of God is secure. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, your state could change. Mine does regularly. Yeah, I'll be in Alaska next week. Amen. Your state can change according to your conduct. But your standing as a child of God, and that's where so many people get mixed up. Amen. When I see that nail... In his holy place, I know that my standing is secure. And I know that when I get to heaven, if I'm wearing a hat, there's going to be a nail for me to hang it on. Amen. Amen. I just threw that in. The rest is all Bible, I promise. <laughs> all right, and the verse goes on and says what? It says uh, uh, that our God may lighten our eyes. Man, we need that, don't we? You know what Paul's commission according to Acts uh, 26 and 18? It said to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and an inheritance among them uh, that are sanctified by faith, that is in me. Hey, to open their eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light. That pretty much describes what happened when I got saved. My wife says it like this. The world went from black and white to color, living color. And that, that thing uh, uh, Ezra prays uh, that God may lighten our eyes. Now in the old days, uh, riding around daytime, the motorcycles, that was while I did. And, uh, and uh, you wear sunglasses, the sun's bright, and then we'd go to bars. Amen. I ain't bragging about it. You go into bars. And guess what? Bars are dark. And if you ever saw one lit up, you know why they're dark. They're filthy. Amen. And so you come out of the bright sun and you step into a place like that dark, you can't see nothing because of the pupil thing. And if I say, I'll say it wrong, so I'm not going to try to figure that out. And I used to have to go in, I'd go in and I'd just, I mean, we had so many enemies. I mean, we worked at it. We had so many, I'd mosey into a place like that and I'd just find a place, find a place uh, next to the wall where nobody get behind me. And, uh, and I'd just stand there for a couple minutes. And you know what happens, don't you? Your eyes adjust, don't they? They get used to the dark. <laughs> this thing says uh, that our God may lighten our, our eyes uh, because I'm sad to report that our eyes, Christian, believer, I'm telling you, our eyes have gotten used to some of the spiritual darkness that's around us. The Bible says in John 3 and 19, and this is the condemnation, the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And I'll tell you what we need. We, I'll tell you, in the course of this, a little reviving, we need our God uh, to lighten our eyes, uh, to show us the wickedness that's around us again, uh, so that we can see it for what it is and quit making excuses for it. Like I said the other day, we keep... Uh, talking about the danger of comparing, uh, that's what the Bible says is not wise, but that's what we're hung up in. Well, compared to so-and-so, don't worry, you won't be. You're accountable to that Bible right there. Amen. Amen. God makes our instructions very clear. He's graceful and he gives us a chance to grow and all that stuff, but I'll tell you what, at the end of the day, you're not the exception. You're accountable. And we need God to lighten our eyes. We don't need another program Amen. We don't need another how-to video. Uh, just put your stinking YouTube away. Amen. There's some things you can't learn there. Amen. Man, I asked somebody a question in passing. Well, I wonder how, I wonder how you do. And then the next thing you know, they got a YouTube video playing in their hand. I remember when people were ignorant. Now we know too much for our own good. We don't know enough Bible for our own good. No, oh, boy, we got the answers to everything else sitting around at a table in the, 
New York City with a preacher and, and his kids, and, and uh, we got talking about how high the Verrazano Bridge was. It goes between Staten Island and Brooklyn. I said, man, that bridge is massive, you know. wonder how high that is. And I mean, and I mean, in 15 seconds, one of the kids said, oh, 277 feet in port four, you know, blah. I go, what? How do you know that? And then their phone's there. Hey, man, well, guess what? Some of them kids have taught some of you adults how to do it, too. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> we need God to lighten our eyes, don't we? And here's why, and here's where we're going. Look what it says. Uh, and give us a little reviving. Don't worry, you can come here every night this week. We can preach every night this month, and this is not going to be enough reviving to get you till you get face to face with the Lord unless he chooses to come at the end of the meeting. <laughs> but if we can get something. We can get some victory. We can get some things nailed down. We can get some things purposed in our heart. We can get a better, clearer uh, uh, vision of, of some things. Maybe God will shine some light on something that maybe you're doing. Say, maybe I ought to quit that. That's, man, that's old Christian experience. Maybe I ought to start doing that. I can do that. I could help. Amen. Amen. That's the Christian life. Amen. We need a little reviving. And I read the verse the other day. It says in Psalm 138 and 7, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. And that's it. Hey, hello. Welcome to America, 2018. Amen. Uh, uh, trouble, I'll say it again. Trouble does not prevent revival. It increases the need for it. And it's usually the ingredient that causes people to seek it. Uh, David wrote in uh, Psalm 85. I think it was 85. Yeah, verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? It's scriptural. What we're doing is scriptural. What we desire is scriptural. What we're praying for is scriptural. It's scriptural to expect God to send it again because he has before. What's the holdup? His arm's not shortened. He hasn't changed. It ain't him. We need a little reviving. And we can have a little reviving. Amen. I'm not a doom and gloom preacher at all. I'm so stinking excited about being saved. I, I'm beside myself. Amen. Amen. Uh, here's why we need it so badly, more than we realize. More than we realize. Sometimes we can clean up pretty good and we forget. You know, we forget where we were when God found us. We start, we get real critical of everybody else and then we start condemning them. I can tell you, I can tell if you're stinking Pharisee or not by how you look at other people. Amen. That's how you can tell. Thank God I'm not as other men are. Even this fellow churchman brother that's here with me. That's where we're at. Amen. You know why it's like that? Because we're in bondage. He said, in our bondage. I'm here to tell you with all the promises and examples and warnings and truths. Truths. The word of truth. With all the truths from the word of God, we are still in bondage to a flesh that it, it fights the spirit, tooth and nail, says so in Galatians 5 and 17, for the flesh lusteth against spirit. That's serious word right there. That's passionate. Lusteth against the spirit. And, the spi and then it says in the spirit against the flesh. That's how it's supposed to work. I know some people, they just flat out laid down. The flesh is one. Well, I'm saved. I'm doing the best I can. Liar. You're not doing the best you can. God's never failed. Amen. Amen. Uh, and the spirit against the flesh, these are contrary to one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Amen. Our flesh is, it, it, it has its affections, uh, I'm talking about diametrically set against the things of God. Amen. A flesh that always wants to uh, please itself first. Jesus told him, guys, over in Luke 9, follow me. Now, we like that, Matthew 4. Follow me, and I'll make these fishes of men. And you got the four men there that did, and then over there, Levi, and three city, go, follow me, and they did. But there's a couple guys over there in Luke 9, for example, that you don't know their name because they said, well, yeah, I will. Yeah, I will. But let, what did he say? Me first. That's the problem. That's the bondage. You want to be first. You want to take care of you first. Anything left over, you need to quit God, giving God the leftovers yeah. and give God what he deserves. Yeah. Your best effort. Say, well, uh, I don't have much to offer. He knew that when he saved you, but he'll bless you. Why don't you give that a try? Why don't you quit trying to do it all yourself, reason it all yourself, talk it over with your friends, spend too much time on a stinking Discovery Channel. Why don't you just submit to God and see what he'll do? And if he, if he fails, okay. 
But he ain't never yet. I don't reckon he's going to in your case. All right, so let's read the verse again, and here's what I say. I'm almost done. And and you don't smell no food cooking, so I'm not in any hurry. (laughs) Potato chips don't smell, do they? And now for a little space, great, hallelujah. Grace has been showed, showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. And that's the desire. This week, that's the purpose, a little reviving. So if you need a space to repent, he's giving it to you. Take advantage of it. If you're taking his grace for granted, well, I wouldn't ask for a show of hands, but I've sure been guilty of it often. And it's time to ask him to forgive you for that. And if the flesh has been running the show, and it will, at the drop of a hat, and drop the hat, uh, confess it. Not to me, not to Pastor Thomas, just get it right with God. Get with God. Get honest with God. He made it as easy to get right with him as he did to make, uh, make, make it for you to get saved in the first place. Say, so what do you got to do? Get honest with yourself. Get honest with God. Amen. And then uh, you get that thing right, you get up and you get back in the fight and go on for God. That book says a just man falleth seven times, but riseth up again. You know what the definition of a loser is? I mean, in the old days, we would say, you don't judge a man by how he goes down, you judge him by how he gets back up. Everybody gets knocked down. Amen. I tell you what, a loser just stays down. I ain't never run with losers yet, and I ain't going to be now. And uh, when I mess up, when, you, when, when I mess up, I'm going to get it right, Lord willing, and get back up and get back in a fight. And if you mess up, I'll give you a hand and help you out. But you got to do it God's way. Amen. Amen. That'll work. If you're not where you should be, I mean, you're here at Philadelphia Baptist Church tonight, and that's where you should be. But if you're not where you should be with the Lord, you need to do something about that. As in, right with God, it's time to give these things, or whatever the Spirit of God may have impressed upon your heart, you need to give it some spiritual attention. And then it can be over. You know, the most important part of a service is like the first five minutes after the preacher gets out of the way. Because that's when you do something with what the Holy Spirit has been impressing on your heart. And you may not know what I'm talking about because you may not be saved. And uh, listen, uh, uh, everybody in here that is was where you are at one time. And that's not a condemnation in one bed. If you're in here and you're not saved, the Bible says ye must be born again. Now, I'm going to go to the original English and tell you what that means. It means ye must be born again. We're not talking about joining churches. We're not talking about uh, things in your life. People, you know why people don't get saved? I've talked to them. I've seen them, man. I know under conviction, and I even had a chance to talk to them. I said, you know, you're not saved, are you? And I had a girl say, no. And I said, why not? And she got real quiet. And I knew what was going on. I could read her mind. I said, you're worried about what you have to give up. That's what people do. They think, well, I wouldn't want to go to hell. I know I'm a sinner. I don't doubt what Jesus did on the cross. I sure don't want no part of that thing called hell. I ought to do this, but I, man, what? And you've got to think about what your friends would think or what, what you might have to give up. Amen. That fellowship track league track I got at charity years ago, it said on the cover, it's just a little simple track. It said, what you missed by being a Christian? You know, here I am, brand new, you know, hair down the middle of my back. I'm looking around. And I picked that thing up and opened it up. You know what it said? It said, hell. And that's why I got saved. I got saved because I knew I deserved to go to hell. I'd heard about it. You've heard about it. I told people to go there. Some of them did. And I was on my way too. And I got in my Bible and I found out that uh, uh, all them guys, I buried them 41 guys. I buried my 11 years with the Outlaws Motorcycle Club. I found out from Luke 16, they, weren't, they, they didn't want my company. They didn't want me to come. If they could have said anything to me like that rich man said, he said, I don't want my brothers to come here. This Bible's true. Jesus is Lord. Salvation is available to any and all that will call upon his name. That's what the book says. And if maybe you're like me, maybe you know people there right now. That's what they'd say to you. Get saved, man. Get saved. Ain't nothing worth being here. If you're in here tonight and you're not saved, you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt. When I say that, I'm not talking about what grandma taught you or some special you saw on TV. I'm talking about on the authority of the word of God. 
And maybe you say, well, I don't know about all that. Well, there's people all over this room, men and women, there's teenagers in here that can open a Bible, whatever's appropriate for your age group, and answer these questions. Now, there's deep things I can't answer. But boy, I'll tell you what, when it comes to how to be born again, I can answer that. Because he made it that simple. And it's because he's interested. You know, people say, well, God, well, how could a loving God put people in hell? He don't. Sin does. God did everything that he could possibly do to give you and me a way to get out of it. And that's what John 3.16 is all about. He gave his only begotten son. That whosoever. That's how I got in. I got in on the whosoever clause. And if you're saved near tonight, so did you. And if you're in here tonight and you're not saved, that's your only shot too. But there's room for you. Boy, our prayer is that you make this thing real to you tonight. And you Christians, I hope the Lord spoke to you. How could he not? Amen. Amen. Uh, Let's all stand. Let's stand and you piano player and song leader, post. (laughs) Get position. Do your thing. Amen. But listen here. Not all is open. And there's going to be an invitation hymn. And uh, the piano's already playing. And uh, if you need to come and pray, the altar's open. If uh, you're not comfortable with that, but you need to pray, pray where you're at. But I'll tell you what, don't just, you know, we, sometimes we just, well, I'll do it later, really. Really, like after what? After who's on the, Herman Cain, who's on the radio? What do you think? The devil, the Bible says in Mark chapter 4, that where the seed is sown, Satan cometh immediately. And boy, he's good at it too. And right now, the Spirit of God is dealing with hearts. And right now, Christians are praying, right? And right now is the best time to do business with God. And you can walk out of here spiritually lighter. And I know, because I tell you why I know, because I've done it both ways. I've just sat there, arms crossed, mind made up. And I've walked out just the way I walked in. But boy, there have been times where I've said, Lord, please. And I've got on my face and said, Lord, I need your help on this. And he says, I know it. (laughs) Boy, when that peace and joy with your Savior gets restored to whatever degree is necessary, boy, he'll lighten the load. You know what we do? We carry around things God never intended us to bear alone. Whatever the need, altars open. Some have come. If you need to come, Come on, if you're not saved, let's bow our heads for a moment, close our eyes. Keep playing, that's okay, but let me ask you something. Heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're in here tonight and you don't have the assurance that I talked about, now you might think, uh, you know, I, I want to go to heaven. You're in church here tonight. I mean, you're not an atheist. But you don't know if you would or not. You'd like to, you hope you do, you pray you will. But you don't know, could I tell you that there is a great blessing with settling that thing and knowing? And if you're not sure and you'd like me to pray for you and I'm not setting you up, I'm not going to front you out and come to you nothing. If you're in here tonight and you're not sure that you'd spend eternity in heaven, God forbid something happens, you step into eternity because you're going to someday. If you're not sure, you'd go to heaven, you'd be before the Bible says to be absent of the body, to be present with the Lord. If that's you in your night, slip your hand up, and I will take note of it, and I will pray for you. Now, it seems like that ought to be easier than it is, but I understand it's not so easy. But boy, it'd be a good first step, be a good start. If you'd like me to pray for you tonight, you're not saved, you're honest enough to admit it, just slip your hand up, I'll pray for you. Now, maybe you're like me. I heard the gospel in a jail cell. And, uh, boy, it hit me right between the eyes. And I thought, oh, boy, this is going from bad to worse. And I didn't respond either. I didn't respond in any way, shape, or form. I growled at the preacher. But it took me a couple weeks. But I sat on that thing. And I, one morning, a couple weeks later, in the quietness of a five-by-seven cell, I said, if what that book says is true, I got a big problem. But that book also says, 
Jesus Christ went to the cross solved that problem. Amen. If you're in here tonight and you're not saved, you can get saved anytime, anywhere, this side of your last breath. The reason, reason we present it with some urgency is simply because you don't know when your last breath's going to be. You need to do business with God. The altar's open. If not, what, song, what number? Page 397. What is it? 397. 397. Get a song book. Let's sing along. Spirit of God moves. Put the song book down and move yourself. Come on up here. Let's pray. <laughs> no turn.